as kind of I said on my tweet, you know, one of the things I've always fought for is like, let's have some transparency, uh, talk more to the community. I, I, I wish that more game developers, game companies would do exactly that. We're seeing a lot of it, which is great. Um, so in an effort to always practice what I preach, I was like, Sean, let's, let's just get on and, and chat. Like we have some great conversations. I think there, there's some wonderful, uh, questions and stories and perspectives that rarely get discussed and talked about. So that's what we get to do here. So I'm hoping, um, I'm hoping you'll just give us kind of, uh, uh, an introduction, Sean, if you would, don't please try not to bore everyone. Uh, but you do have a pretty interesting sort of entry into this and how you kind of end up for it. Let's start there. Who who are you, Sean? Sure. Uh, I'm Sean. I'm the COO of Fortis Games. We kind of founded Fortis a little bit over a year ago. Uh, backgrounds, I started out as a lawyer, uh, went to law school, started working in the entertainment industry, uh, quickly realized that maybe I wasn't born for the movie industry, uh, asked my firm whether or not they'd let me do video game work instead. They told me it was a tiny industry that wasn't going to go anywhere, but if I wanted to waste my career on it, I could. Uh, so I, I founded the video game team at my firm. That was right when like mobile and social games just started to be in existence and things went pretty well from there. I made it about three years as a lawyer, and then I moved into um, you know working on the business side to do like business development. I made it, I don't know, two years of doing that. Then I became a game designer. Then eventually I became uh, someone who like ran startups and founded startups. And so I sold a few startups along the way. What was the what right usually if you're 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 a lawyer you you specialize in this type of work and then you're you're in an industry and then you change a job in the industry what was the thing that made you go you know yes i could write contracts and work on this and ip and legal and trademarks and all this fun stuff but what what was the thing that made you i mean were you just like i love this industry i love gaming i want to do more than what I'm doing now? I mean, games, games are always the thing for me in terms of like my love. I just never really thought I would make it my career. Like that wasn't, I didn't go to law school and be like, I'm going to be a video game lawyer one day. Like that wasn't really a thing that existed back then. Right. Um, you know, so when, when the opportunity to try to found something and, and, and build something inside of my firm for games, like popped up and the firm was willing to let me try like that, that was like, a major moment for me right because it meant i get to spend all my time talking to people that were trying to build games as opposed to um you know people that were making movies or whatever sure. and i just found i got along better with the people that wanted to build games like that those were my people growing up they're my people now it's unlikely to change i'm unlikely to grow from them being my people like this is this is my life. I we I think we have to stop there and the chat is going to be like, well, hold on a second, buddy. We need to see your, you know, game credentials here. Uh, right. Not not saying that anyone here in this channel is gatekeeping, but they're going to be pretty interested now. OK, buddy, what games did you play then, Mr. Lawyer growing up? Like, tell us all about that. And yeah, I mean, I, I think like like in terms of like credibility establishment, I mean, I have a steam deck, right? Like, like, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a casual here, right? Like just get this thing over here. Oops. Boom. There it is. Right. Um, you know, I think for me, I, uh, I grew up on, on console gaming until online was a thing, right? Like, and for me, it was like text-based muds in the nineties is really where like on AOL, I, I would just go hard on those. Um, and then I moved into like Ultima online and I played that into the ground these days. It's really, um, I play a ton of independent games. Like that's where I spend the vast majority of my time, uh, on steam playing independent games. I play a ton of mobile games too. Uh, you know, but in general, I, I find that independent games tend to have most of the interesting design that I'm, I'm interested in and, um, you know, I, I like playing those games. Yeah. I mean, you really quickly went over Ultima Online and that might have been with intention because I feel like I could probably talk about Ultima Online for 24 hours a day. Um, do you I have any, do you, do you want to share at least like one, 
one great memory. I mean, you got to understand, I was like a teenager that was feeling somewhat socially isolated and Ultima Online was a platform for destruction. Um, and it's just, I, I mean, I was a complete menace, right? Like, I, I, I just... I, I well that's the, that was the beauty of that game is the freedom to be as menacing and and misfit like or as as good as you know you 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 could be I think that's what why you that game was so unique for 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 each persona that you wanted to it, inhabit right you're absolutely so, right yeah 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 I mean so the, I I mean. I never went like full PK or like that player killer. Like I was never really into that, but I certainly was into just randomized mischief throughout the realm. Right. So definitely like had a bunch of thieves that I played all the time. Um, like just generally enjoyed screwing around with like, there's a stamina mechanic where if someone walked through you, then they had to wait for the stamina recharge yes, before yeah. they could walk through another block. And so there were various different chokeholds throughout the game where there was like one block and you could stand with two people and then they would get stuck in between for like three or four minutes while their stamina was recharging. Yes. And it seems like a small thing, but when you're 14 and uh, you know, you're given that level of control over, over the universe, it's, it's, it's really intoxicating. Yeah. I, uh, I actually did to, to speak to your personas, uh, and different types of personas. Like I had w one of my favorites was the tutorial killer where you, you could clearly tell who a brand new person who'd logged into the game for the first time. And the game was brutal, right? Like it didn't say, Hey, go over here, <laughs> chop down a tree, do this, make this. So you'd spend a couple hours like really gaining this person's trust. Let me teach you how to fish. Let me teach you how to make fish cakes here. Here, Here's a mine you can go to. Here's a thing. And then you're like, all right, you're doing great, Bob. It's time to learn the most important lesson that you can learn in Ultima <laughs> Online. And then you just slay them. They're like a ghost. They're ooh, ooh, ooing you. And you're like, don't trust anyone. And that's why that game was incredible and I, amazing. So I remember because like we used to be based in Minoc, uh, which is kind of like one of the more remote towns. And that's where I, I was like... based. Yeah. You probably slayed me on multiple occasions and vice versa. <laughs> then uh, what, 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 what? I was what Great Lakes. I was Great Lakes. Great Lakes. Okay. I would go to Great Lakes when Pacific was down and cause mayhem on Great Lakes. So we might have crossed paths at that point. Uh, but uh, the, I remember I spent all this time like harvesting like trees and iron and blah, blah, blah. And I finally made myself like a, a suit of plate mail. And it took forever. And I, <laughs> and I just, I finally did it. And I walked like, four steps out of town it was immediately killed <laughs> lost all my stuff and then you know I, I come running back and then like you know most of my stuff is still there because it was completely worthless as far as the player was concerned right, right. And i was like I, I spent like i was actually a little offended like i'd spent like 40 hours like slowly mining <laughs> to get this stuff right it wasn't even worth looting from my corpse right uh, yeah too much too uh, much weight it was good it was good times um so you kind of you mentioned you you kind of went to a lawyer. You got it involved. You didn't think games was going to be. I mean, I feel like I can. That story resonates with me. I I've always loved gaming. Right, kind of went in esports through content creation. Took twenty years to finally get into a situation where now I'm working with a company that's actually you know building games and thinking about that. Um, so I mean, you clearly have a, a love for games. Is that the only reason you've stayed in or what have been the other kind of motivating things and, and that's made you want to keep at this industry, oh. which is definitely a tough industry, right? Passion, I think, um, brings you in and it helps sustain, but you're right. It's like a really, it's a really tough industry. Like it's tough for a bunch of different reasons, right? Like most things that get created fail. That sucks. It sucks to make things that don't work out. Right. Um, you know, it's really tough to stay on top of the industry. It changes a lot. Yeah. So you constantly have to study it. It's like, you know, your skills today may not be valuable in three years. So you, you pretty much always have to be investing in your skills. Um, I, I, I tend to think that the commercial opportunity of games is just massive. Like, I think it's like if you're going to be working in any industry that is like likely to keep growing likely to sustain itself like i think games is pretty much the top and the big change that's happened in the last you know 
10 years is that games came uh, went from a relatively like isolated group of people that had uh, sort of the desire to invest a significant amount in the hobby to like a much broader group of people through free to play, through mobile, right. through you know any number of, of things that have kind of you know expanded the audience from you know call it low tens of millions, maybe you know low hundreds of millions to three three billion people now play games. Uh, so I, I think that side of it makes makes sense. Um, but really, at the end of the day, it's just like I just like the people, honestly. Like it's it's pretty much what keeps yeah. me in the industry is I find I get along with uh, you know the proper nerds that tend to to, to inhabit the game space um, more than the alternatives. Like the other ter- the alternatives are more stable. You know, you can go work. I'm in Silicon Valley. And, like I can go work at one of the big tech companies. Uh, I guess all the big tech companies are going into games now too. But like, you know, for a long time, uh, I just felt like I got along with the people a lot better in games. Um, you mentioned, you know, the past 10 years and I look at the last 10 years too. And, and uh, you know, 10, almost string on 15. And there has been an enormous amount of change. New things have, have hit. You mentioned a few of them, but what do you think some of the more exciting things or trends that we've seen in the last 10 years are to yeah. you? I'm, I'm super fascinated by the rise of communities specifically. Like what we're doing here is like a good example, Like this as a thing, uh, didn't exist, you know, 10, 15 years ago. Right. Like you could go to forums and that was like the type of content that you could kind of get about around games. And the forums were okay, but not particularly like interactive, like not like it, it, the community just wasn't well orchestrated back then. Right. And if you look in the modern era, it's this really, really rich set of platforms where if you are a fan of something, you can kind of live the hobby and interact with people in a bunch of different ways and consume content in a bunch of different ways all day long. I I think that's probably the most powerful change that's happened in the last 10 years in games. Yeah. And to me is the most interesting one. Um, accessibility is the other one. Like, you know, the idea that the hobby is made available to everyone through changes in business model, changes in platform. Um, you know, I don't, I don't want PC and console to die. Like I'm a massive PC console sure. gamer. Right. But I, I do want games to be available to everyone. And a lot of people can't afford, you know, a few thousand dollars to put into, you know, a good gaming rig, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and and even to your point about accessibility, like for me, technical accessibility. Now, I'm not really sold on cloud gaming. I have had kind of weird experience, but I feel like the Steam Deck has given me the ability to play more games that fit into my time frames that I that I have to be able to play or how I can play them and wider variety. So I I completely agree. And obviously, you're not going to hear me argue about community and how much that has has changed it. You know, I I think so much and so often about the early days of being so excited coming home with a game pro or an EGM mm-hmm. or a gaming mag and like staring at these pictures on a pages for, you know, days before. I can't believe you uh, dog Nintendo power like that. That's well, I, so I specifically said, come home with meaning that I went to the store and purchased a Game Pro or EGM. And if I'm not mistaken, Nintendo Power was never sold in retail. It was That's uh that's a good that's a that's a good deep cut on lore there. <laughs> I, I'm just saying I I, I it, it was a very hard day when I threw away my 10,000 pounds of gaming magazines. Like I'm even ashamed to say that I did it, but after I moved for the fourth time and I'm like I can't I can't lug these three tons of gaming uh, history around, which shame on me. But uh, so so we went from that to then schoolyard discussions about games to then, um, you know, things like 
IGNs starting to pop up and 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 having I think game facts became a big thing and then there was almost yep. an era of like oh no they're those those companies are they're too corporate already I need something better and then the indies blogs hit and destructoids blowing up and joystick and and then that was completely dismantled as we saw things like YouTube, Twitch, this, you know, audience rich interaction. I think one of the most uh, important aspects of that sort of evolution of community to where we're at now is that the thing that I always hated about an IGN or a game magazine is that there was never context for the author of a review, right? So I, I don't like driving games. I'm just like driving is already enough of a chore. It's not something that necessarily I I feel like is is a fun to do. Um, and so when people hear me talk about a game that has driving in it, they can go, well, Wheat hates driving games. I like driving games. So even if he says it's a bad game, it's not right. It, it made the games experience a little bit more personable. And then I think became easier to even find things that you would like because it you could identify if co carnage likes these types of games and he really likes these games. I like those types of games. I can say that too. It really opened uh, uh, up a lot there in terms of the evolution of game news and how we related to people that, that yeah. played games. I mean, the same thing can be said about mu movie reviewers or, or whatever, but um I was going to ask. I do really love, Go ahead. like, as things opened up, the ability for people to find a niche and really, um, like, cater to it. Like, that's what I love about YouTube. That's what I like about Twitch. Like, it's harder to kind of, like, discover those people uh, sometimes on Twitch. Like, I have to do, like, game level searches and hope I catch them at the right time. But, like, um, like I've been a big fan of, like, Lethal Frag on Twitch for a long time, ever since he did his, like, two year challenge. And it's just because he played a lot of, like, the roguelite indie games that I really like. You know, and I like being able to find a community that like suits like my preferences well. Like I, I think that's like why right. YouTube's amazing. It's just no, it doesn't really matter what your random thing is that you you're into. Like if you want to see some guy make knives out of like rice and spoons, and you know, like there's a dude doing that in Japan, and you can watch it all day long, right? Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, like that that type of stuff is is really um, amazing. The fragmentation of the community that comes out of that, I think, is like positive and negative, right? Um, like, I think there's trade-offs to to that model. Um, like, unifying messages tend to be negative now, right? And positive messages tend to be fragmented, right? Like, a small group cares about the positive message, a large group cares about the negative message, um, and that kind of has had some unfortunate impacts on like how I view the gaming community which i don't know makes me sad <laughs> yeah <laughs> you know, yeah it wasn't always that way no i i i get it um and i think you know in some ways you're talking about uh a, a feeling uh, that i think a lot of people are experiencing just on the internet in 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 general right i yeah. i don't know that that's uh, it's unique to gaming because of how driven it is by the content that we've got going on around us at, at all times, for sure. Um, I was going to ask you, right? Uh, you, we mentioned the 10 years to kind of wrap this this kind of part up and there's some questions have come in that are great already. But um, what do you think the biggest technological impact is in kind of the recent years on on gaming? Um, right. There was probably a time where I would have said it's game spy, right? The fact that I can find servers that I like and friends and whatever. And, then, um, now we've got Twitch discord, all of these other things that have kind of come in that have helped, um, uh, supplement and enhance the game, the gaming community, whether that's a, uh, something in game, a uh, game type a, a model or whatever, but what do you think is kind of what's exciting or, or do you think is the biggest technological impact um, so there's there's a couple of different answers um certainly the available of high bandwidth data to like a broader group of people has been massive right like for a long time the like the tooling around data uh like you know access to high-speed internet that type of stuff was a major gate right so if you didn't have like a brick and mortar right like, sell you a box you really couldn't you couldn't participate you know so that change which is really like 
maybe we're used to and expect ban you know, high bandwidth downloads in the states, uh, but that's that that wasn't uniform, right? So I I think that's like a really significant shift. Um, there's like other things that I think are more like micro, but like and maybe not necessarily like pure technology, but I think have been really impactful. So for example, like the structure of the Steam store around tagging and how that makes discovery of niche uh, products and makes it possible for niche products to sort of exist and find audience without having to have like substantial marketing campaigns. I think that's been really powerful for enabling like Definitely. a bunch of independent yes. development, yes. which I think is super, super valuable. Like it's quite challenging to be discovered on most other platforms relative to uh, Steam, right? Like I get a queue and that queue is like pretty good at finding the weird stuff that I might want to play, right? Um, and so I think that's been like a really helpful shift for development in general. Um, and maybe the last one is the accessibility of game engines. So for a right. long time, uh, getting access to like an unreal, uh, license was like pretty challenging. You had to be at like a studio, you need a certain amount of money. It was just not easy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Uh, and then like, I think those engines have been democratized pretty substantially unity unreal both which means that you have this giant generation of developers that are able to start developing and experimenting and putting things out there, which I think has been incredibly healthy for games. Too. Yeah, I, I completely agree. In fact, someone in chat earlier was saying that is that, you know, it's never, uh, there's never been a better time to get into game development, considering what's available out there, resources, uh, video tutorials. I mean, the way the uh, I was watching some videos about the Unreal uh, Engine structure, where you can almost like mod, you know, create modules and turn that into. Yep. I mean, it's it's incredible. It, it it's really, really is amazing. Stuff. Yeah. So um, awesome. I I I, I want to dive deeper into some Fortis related stuff, but we did kind of talk a little bit about uh, you know. You framed it. I'm going to just use, go ahead and use the word toxicity, uh, kind of framed it in sort of the, the good and the bad, but considering the toxicity has become like a growing concern, not only in, in the game space, but uh, internet as a whole, I'm curious what you think, uh, what role that, you know, game studios play in trying to promote more positive gaming experiences and then also you know what role do you think the players play sure uh i think people tend to follow incentives right and right now if you're a content creator uh you get a lot more out of drama and uh sort of just engaging in the sort of like the noisiest things that are going on at any given time. Like it's just algorithmically weighted, right? Like we, we know this, like rage travels faster, much faster than basically any other emotion. It shares faster, it creates engagement faster. And if all of the algorithms are essentially oriented towards rewarding the things that have the most engagement, well, it's not really any surprise that lowest common denominator messages that have the highest emotional content tend to travel the fastest, right? Um, and I don't think that there's a lot of positive incentives to trying to be like a very positive creator. Like, I don't think it's well rewarded inside of the ecosystem. And so as a developer, you sort of have to ask yourself, is there value to trying to create positive incentives? Right? Or is it just a right. fool's game that the, the endemic algorithm is just always going to dominate and creating positive incentives are never strong enough. I, I tend to think that positive incentives for positive behavior, positive interaction is like a healthy thing for a, yeah. a, a game developer to create in an ecosystem. I think it's challenging. I think there's always going to be a debate of like, well, are they picking winners and losers? I tend to think that, um, you know, there is some risk to that, especially if it doesn't feel fair or transparent how that how that was done. Um, but at the end of the day, I don't like I'm not very present on social media. Like I don't I, I, I you know, like, as a part of Fortis, I've had to do more right. I'm here. You know, I, I'm writing blogs, doing that type of stuff. But, you know, normally I just sit in the background and, and, and don't put things out there publicly, um, you know, in my personal capacity 
Uh, but I've been participating on most social media platforms in like various different like anonymous ways throughout time, just studying them and seeing how they work and seeing what's incentivized. And really what I've just learned is going all in on gaming the algorithm is 100% the best way to build an audience quickly and fast. Um, and there's a bunch of different ways that you can do that. But if you look at that as a set of incentives for a person that wants to spend percentage of their time doing content creation and having that content be seen by people it, it's quite it's quite difficult to escape that sort of like dilemma um, yeah it is and so I, I i do think developers could could have a role uh through positive incentives positive rewards for positive behavior uh i i think it's worthwhile to consider it worthwhile to invest in it do i think it will be wildly successful i don't know I mean, I playing, playing devil's advocate a little bit, uh, let's say a handful of companies try and do a great job. And, uh, you know, it, we, we see some impact, uh, more positive reinforcement, as you kind of mentioned. But if there's not a collective effort by the games company as a whole, does it I guess, A, does it, does it matter? And B, do you think it, it's going to take a company to, to say, all right, let's, let's try to do things a little bit different. Let's come up with this new mechanic or this new way of doing something in order for that to happen. Because I mean, gaming is definitely dictated by trends. If something appears to be successful and it, uh, you know, is financially good for a company, I would expect that we'll see 30 companies that would turn around and, and right mimic that and or mirror that or echo that. Um, so, A, do you think even the smallest impact makes a large impact? Does that matter? And then, B, do you think it's going to take a good example for it to – for that to, to – I think to... A, a game – a game developer needs to produce a game of sufficient success where those positive incentives exist and the positive incentives need to be viewed as part of the reason why that game was successful in order for people to follow it. Great example is like esports, right? Like most people just didn't think esports was like a business or it was really viable, right? right? Like until Riot did it at such scale, and then everyone's like, well, like League must be successful because of it you know they kind of ignored a fairly rich history in starcraft and counter-strike and all these other things that existed before because they hadn't really broken through like that threshold of cultural sort of relevance for an investor right and after league now all of a sudden you have all these like game teams you know esports teams getting significant rounds of funding and investment because you know the future is is esports I mean, like what really changed, right? Like right. what changed was Twitch existed, um, you know, that there was like a much richer ecosystem of people watching things, DAUs that were attached with it that could make like an argument around audience and value of that audience and a key demo, 18 to 49, right? And that all just kind of added up to, well, I guess this is a thing now and we should all have an esports solution, right? Um, and I right. think the industry tends to work that way. So, uh, you know, look at look at like uh, Twitch integrations around like loot drops, right? Like, I don't think anyone cared until Valorant started doing that stuff, and then now all of a sudden it's like, well, maybe maybe working with influencers are, is a good idea. Maybe maybe they're not the enemy. Maybe they're actually part of the solution, right? Like, you know, but that that wasn't obvious until it was successful, right? Um, yeah, people yeah. attributed the success of the launch of the game in part to that. So I tend to think that we were successful. And we had positive incentives and people looked at our community and said, man, that community seems to operate in a way that, that, that people are having a generally more positive experience. And that sure. seems like it's made the game healthier and people have stayed engaged for longer because they don't get burned out about the experience in the same way. Then I think other people would, would rapidly follow it. Multiple companies would like, you know, do like you know, positive incentives as a service, you know, Uber for incentives or whatever that would start getting pitched and then they would get funded and, it would spread out. Um, I don't think it takes that much, though. I think the activation energy to try something new is very high. Yes. Right. Definitely. Like when Riot started doing the esports stuff, people are like, why are they doing that? Why is that valuable? It's just like a little niche thing. Right. And I think that confluence of free to play plus Twitch plus esports plus a game that that had like a high audience demand was what really was required to shift. And so I think it yeah. takes a lot 
to get others to follow, but yeah. it's not, it's not possible. Right. Right. Um, so we've got a, I, I think all the things that we've chatted about already have, have brought in some really good questions. Um, I definitely want to discuss something that I think several people have come in and tried to get more clarity about. Um, right. I think when it, when it comes to game development and this is, this is not a shocker to you or anyone else in the chat. Cause I talked about it. Like one of my hesitations is, Hey, I've, I've never been a part of a game development studio. So I, I know what I don't know, but I don't know what I don't know. And that was, I think something that was going to be a big challenge. Now, I think that as gamers, we all create these, um, uh, you know, scenarios in our mind of like, this must be how a game development company works. Uh, but clearly there are uh, nuances in the tradition, the process, the organization, some of those things I've talked about, some of them uh, I think we have questions about, but you've clearly stated as we kind of move on specifically to Fortis and, and the company that the founders have put together uh, and talked about the design lane. So I'd like to do maybe a two part before I jump in these first questions, which is what do you think, uh, or what is one thing that you wish that every gamer or player understood about game development and what would that be? And then also, uh, can you dive a little bit deeper into the design lane? Uh, what that means. Uh, someone brought up your blog earlier and uh, some good blogs out there. I'll make sure that they're posted. Uh, you can get some perspective from Sean, but can you dive into that aspect as well? So question one, what do you wish every gamer, player, et cetera, understood about game development or should understand and then be or to talk in a little bit about the, the design lane and what that actually means? So the first and I think most important gap between game developers and gamers is that the games that get developed are a product of the incentives that game developers have. And what I mean to say by that is there's always like I, you know, I read I read Reddit quite often, right? I, I participate in the community pretty strenuously. And there's always the kind of comment like, why did they do X? Like, why don't they just do Y? right how come this it's always this why aren't more games of this type made right this game was amazing why did they stop right and the short answer is money always money the answer is always money right like there's money for this there's not money for that money put into this feels secure and safe money put into that feels insecure and unsafe and i might get fired if i put money into that does money right? include like, time sean because right, i mean Time is money. I mean, there's a very sophisticated equation that does say okay. time equals money. And okay. I do think that there is a component <laughs> of that, right? God, um, yeah. the, the, the reason why I say that is there's a question of like, why do AAA games look the way they look? And the answer is, is money. Like there's a, it is very expensive, very time consuming to create a triple a game creating a new triple a game from scratch is really 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 risky right you're looking at getting a team together working in a new world the ip if it's slightly off if it's poorly realized if your metacritic uh, scores get flag five you're just taking like a 50 million dollar loss on that game right and it's really public and it's really embarrassing and so if you're looking at that as an option versus maybe we should just you know, green light, I don't know, game, uh, you know, game, game five, you know, in the, in a particular franchise, people follow that. And then there's other like structured incentives that relate to all that too, right? Like, are you the platform, right? Like it makes tons of sense to create new intellectual property that's exciting and exclusive mm -hmm. to a platform if you're Sony or Microsoft, you know, or, you know, or, 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 or Nintendo, if you are an independent publisher, it makes a lot less sense, right? Because if you lose money, you just lose money. Whereas the value of having exclusive, pretty decent content on a platform allows you to sell more of that platform, right? right? right. So like, there's all these like secondary incentives that exist that like cause an industry look uh, the way it does, right? Like mobile looks the way it does for a set of reasons, right? 
um, indie looks the way it does for a set of reasons, right? There's a reason why there's like Souls-like games now because building something for that tag means that you're going to get a clear niche market, right? Yep. And so occasionally games will come in and establish a new tag and that's exciting and fun for everyone because it's like, oh, I want to see more games like that. And that cool part about Steam is that it creates a lot of incentives for that to happen, yep. right? Because yep. of how that ecosystem works. So when I read like gamer frustration, I really uh, empathize with where they're at. Like I, I get why they're frustrated. I would generally say game developers are are often frustrated by the set of incentives that exist, but the set of incentives have been well optimized for like the financial outcomes in the industry. And you know, when we went about pitching Fortis, we were pretty far off of the set of incentives that we were supposed to follow. And it definitely like during the pitching process was like making some people annoyed that we were not like following the rules of what we were supposed to say, right? Um, like when we were ra raising, like it was very clear that our team, which pretty high credibility team, like Steve Chang, the president, you know, is, you know, he was the head of worldwide studios and kind of founded studios have been really successful. And I've sold a few companies. Like we, we knew the right people, but we really were supposed to say web three when we, when we went out a year and a half ago, right? Like we were, we were really supposed to do that. And when we didn't do that, people were like, well, what do you want to do? And when we started talking about the design lane, which I could explain, but like that, that, that was not the thing to say. And it was frustrating because they wanted to invest in us. And, you know, in a lot of cases, I wanted to be partners with those people, but like we were not following the set of incentives right. that existed inside of the environment at that time. Right. And it's kind of the way it works and we can debate whether it's good or bad or healthy or unhealthy. Um, but it is, it is kind of the way it works. Like what it takes is significant disruption, right? Um, like it takes a major change in platform. It takes a major change in distribution, right? Like that's why yep. I'm so fascinated by community. It's a major change in distribution. Cross platform games can exist now, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, that's, that's different. That that's not, that wasn't true six years ago. Right. Like, you know, maybe some things could break through like a Minecraft, but really nothing else could. Right. So, um, if I were to sum it up neatly, I'd say, uh, the difference between people that make investments, want to make games and want to play games, um, are probably less than you might think but their incentives don't align in the way that, that people really want sometimes. Right. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I mean, great. I, I love that. Totally, totally understand. Um, kind of shifting gears to the design lane because you mentioned we were, we weren't necessarily following the traditions. They're clearly bringing something to the table that was trying to approach things differently. Uh, understanding that there's that anytime you're going to do that, there's, there's a risk. There's kind of a formulaic way that you could probably approach the games industry and find some love of success. That's certainly not guaranteed. Um, talk to us a little bit about the design lane for Fortis, right? I think when people always inquire with me or they're, they're asking, maybe they've read one of your blogs and they they've heard this, they've, they've heard an employee kind of talk about it. Um, give us the, give us the Sean Faust, you know, uh, design lane breakdown for those that are like, I can't, there's too many words on this blog. I'm not going to read this, this thing. So now you've got the uh, chance to catch them now. You, you should definitely read all 2000 words of that blog. Um, just, and, and Multiple subscribe. times. Uh, by the way. Yeah. So the design lane is made up. It's a way of describing um, how we want to compete in the industry. And so what I did is I went through and I categorized lanes uh, because anytime you're in a startup, you need to basically say what you are and what you aren't as quickly and succinctly as possible and then begin to develop your own independent brand. Right. Uh, so in this case, what I said is most of the industry operates against a standard set of incentives, just like I talked about. Right. And they end up in what I would call like arbitrage lanes. These are lanes where the investment of capital really goes towards marketing and publishing as opposed to the creation of new design models. Uh, we see that a lot where it's like take out battle royales. 
right? Where they just kind of spread throughout the entire ecosystem really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, that's because most companies are arbitrage companies. They aren't trying to generate um, a new idea. Like you know, they aren't trying to move their game from team deathmatch to battle royale uh, proactively. But if a trend takes over, they have enough marketing and publishing capability that they can co-opt that trend, bring it into their brand and marketing ecosystem, and then sort of like arbitrage their brand successfully. Right. 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 That's where the vast majority of capital goes if you're like a large company. Right. But it makes sense. Like again, like if you are have billion dollar franchises, you don't really want to disrupt your own franchise. And if your franchise is going to be disrupted, it makes sense to be reactive to mm -hmm. that. Like they're not doing stupid stuff. It's just, you know, and starting something new, like who cares about a $50 million business? It doesn't move the needle. No investor is going to get out of bed for it. So like playing billion dollar ball is really like where everything kind of exists. Makes sense. Like, I mean, we all want to call them evil. They're not evil. They're just, again, following their incentives. Um, there's other lanes that are like more like disruption lanes. And these are like sort of where VCs tend to operate. Okay? And they're very much like, hey, um, this thing is mature. It's, it's, it's too hard for someone else to come in and compete. And because of that, we're looking for the next thing, right? And so we kind of know what the next things are right now, which is um, like Web3, right? NFT is the next thing. Uh, Digital player ownership is the next thing. Uh, metaverses are the next thing. You know, like like that's the next thing, right? And uh, <laughs> as as an investment, um, next things are very attractive because it's basically saying, hey, listen, um, if there is a next thing in games, well, games is a very large industry, and if it's going to be turned over the same way it was by mobile or by the internet, then being early in that can produce a really significant outcome. Right. Therefore we should invest into that. And even if we make 50 investments and only one works out, the one will pay for the 50 that we missed on. Right. Um, and so that's, that's what we'll call like the disruption lane. The design lane is very much like there's a set of design models that have become entrenched and they were based on a set of, uh, of assumptions around where the industry was at. Um, right. And they haven't been revisited. And there's a bunch of different styles of design lane companies. Indies tend to be design lane companies, right? They tend to be, they're very focused with two or three people. And they're like, how do I create something that is sufficiently interesting or unique mm -hmm. that people are willing to download it? Because we don't have a team of 300 to create an immersive world, right? So right, they often right. come up with clever and creative designs. Hence why I tend to play indie games. Um, there are other styles of, of, of design. Um, and one of them is the one that we tend to focus on. So that shift from deathmatch to battle royale, that's what we'll call contextual system design. The moment to moment gameplay didn't uh, change massively, right? It's still shooting in a space, like, but like the context around that moment to moment gameplay changed, changed. pretty dramatically. Mm -hmm. Because some of the assumptions that had governed the shooting space, like you can't put 100 people on a, on a phone, for example, to play in the same space, bandwidth won't work, queue liquidity won't work, all these reasons why it existed in a certain model before. Um, like the idea that there are many genres that have known game to, uh, moment to moment gameplay and they haven't had interesting contextual system design advancement in a long period of time, that's what we tend to focus on. And we take like a portfolio strategy. It's a range of risk based off of like the different audiences that we think we can go after. And you know, from our perspective, the opportunity is massive in the design lane around this stuff. And there's very few companies that have funding to pursue it right now. Awesome. Uh, I want to jump to a couple of questions that have come in from the, from the chat. I don't know if you're keeping an eye on those, but um, so I'm going to jump, I'm going to jump, right in and do a couple so uh mind messer asks i thought your medium article around the game investment game was great you wrap it up with the note that fortis has fortunately found design focused investment but how stable and long is fortis's runway excited to see what you guys produce right and i think it is an interesting question uh contextually to what you said because the innovation the indies that are existing in design lane uh they typically are Right, a group of friends that you know have m financial motivation if their game is successful, but you know maybe have all the time to work on the, their game, giving their own time up to it. 
if that game happens to fail, they might not be able to make the same investment. And so there's a, a lot of risk there. So uh, what do you, you know, what, what's your answer to, to mind messer here in terms of uh, um, sure. the runway? So when Steve and I went out and pitched, I think we, we talked to, let's say like a hundred different like type of types of investors, right. Or you know, hundred different investors of different types is a better way of putting it. Right. Um, you know, we talked to VCs, we talked to private equity firms, we talked to strategic partners, like all sorts of different ones. And through that process, we sort of narrowed it down to a small group of, of investors that we felt understood what we were trying to go for and would support us in, in building it in a way that could be successful. Uh, because like the design lane is really hard to make work if you only get one, one shot at it. It's better to be able to run a portfolio, which means you need uh, multiple teams at the same time, right? Uh, you right. need to be able to learn from your, you know, from your choices, the decisions that you make, because you struggle with a lot of ambiguity around like what the right choice is, because you can't use a lot of existing models. Um, and so we, we basically ended up with like a strategic partner where we're a wholly owned subsidiary of that partner. And we came together around this idea that they wanted to sort of diversify into new areas. And we wanted to, um, you know, build a certain way that was a bit contrarian and like the overlap between our viewpoints and theirs was, was, was really high. And so I think we have runway as long as we're thoughtful stewards of the capital that, that we're supported with. And, you know, we build our team and we, 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 we do what we say we're going to do, right? I, I think patience is a finite commodity and you shouldn't yeah. take it lightly, particularly when people are supporting you and backing you. Yeah. And yeah. so from our perspective, like it, it's, it is very much about showing progress quarter over quarter, year over year. And I'd like to see that manifest in the games and, you know, the upcoming couple of years. Like I thought that's where I'd like us to be. You know, we spent the first year really setting everything up, getting the teams into place, getting the right sort of executive support. You know, it's, Marcus is why you're here, right? Um, you know, it, it's, it's now really about full on development, which is really like the, the posture that we're moving into now. Um, so yeah. the short answer is mind, um, I don't take anything for granted. Like I think anytime anyone supports you, it's pretty much a gift and like, you gotta, gotta earn that every single day. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, so I feel pretty stable. I feel pretty secure, but there's no guarantees in the industry and the best guarantee we can do around longevity and survival is to produce, produce results. Right. Again, yeah. incentives are incentives and that's what our incentive is. Yeah. Um, I'm going to do a follow up question for my master too, because I think this, this fits in well, but, uh, what aspects of Fortis would you say are more traditional co-opted from prior business examples by comparison with the innovation you're looking to drive with the design lane? Sure. Well, there's certain things around like team structure and how development, uh, works that I, I don't think is particularly valuable to mess with right um sure. so like we we really do look for like division of responsibilities we look for like a movement through phases it's not the same thing as like the standard green light milestones and dates that exist at, at a lot of companies um but like it is still like sort of a phased model of as we are our confidence in a particular project increases then you know the resources and support for that thing increases as well um you know in general we we have a hard time just like taking things from other places because most of those things were not based off of like a global remote environment, which right. is what we're running. And so it's like tough, right? Like, like, like standard cultural practices, like don't really work in the same way. Right. Um, you know, like there's, there's all sorts of like interesting communication shifts, you know, um, like the industry tends to be dominated by, um, like, really, really strong, charismatic individuals um, that are capable of like being highly motivational and persuasive and not just the green light setting where they're talking to a bunch of executives that may not know a whole lot about like game design and they need to have a painter, uh, you know, a picture painted for them. Um, but they also then have to communicate to all their game teams. And a lot of the times they're making a bunch of like highly speculative choices around like, mm -hmm. why should the world be this way versus that way? And they need to be persuasive while they do that, right? And so like that model tends to dominate in the standard um, industry doesn't work really well in like a remote environment. Uh, yeah. you know, like I, I, 
charisma does not travel very well via zoom unfortunately um so <laughs> it starts to be a lot more about like the thought process and how you deliberate how you write you know, how you think about things you know so marcus like you have a great reputation right like you know in terms of like what you've done what you've built over time that's awesome it's not why you got a job here. You got a job with Fortis because you wrote a 30 page treatise on how communities should work. You know, you and I went back and forth on it through comments and deep debate over time. And I felt like as a thinker, you know, you would not just be able to like help push us forward, but you would also be able to communicate the right. depth of what needed to change to other people. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, it's, it's so interesting too, Sean, because, um, you know, it's it's exciting to be a company that is like, we're going to do things differently. We're going to think about it differently. But then there's also this sort of internal balance. And you kind of mentioned it in a few different areas where, you know, global remote being one of those things. And I, I, I the one aspect I think I fear is, uh, you know, when you're making a decision on is this the best structure for us to have or is this the there's also the flip side where I think you can it's really easy to overthink things in terms of like, no, we have to do everything new to wrap into what we, we want to do. And, um, I saw, I've seen this happen in the it world. I've seen this happen a little bit at, at Twitch and, you know, it's like, well, wait a second. If we're evaluating that this thing actually works out fine and, and it, it does fit into even our, our different views and ways that we might do something, you know, do you ever do you think that there is a risk of like overcorrecting in in that way and you know uh, we're not going to co-op this method because we are global mode and design first lane when that might just be the best way to go about something uh i think it's a risk uh yeah you know, it, 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 you guys might have been able to figure out this point. Like I have very impractical goals, but I'm extremely pragmatic about how I pursue them. Right. Um, mm -hmm. you know, the way, the way I look at it is you should not start by saying, well, since we're global or, you know, first, like, like nothing, nothing that's been done before applies and we're going to do things differently just because we're going to do things differently. You shouldn't start saying like there are a set of assumptions that apply to the old system. Do we think those assumptions also apply here? And then what yeah. we call it like reasoning from first principles, you basically go through. And if the outcome is you do the same thing that was being done before, great. Everyone already knows that thing. That's amazing. But you just need to question it. You don't need to discard it. Right. Yeah. Uh, to, staying on track with, with global remote and we're going to kind of hop around here again. Thanks you. Whatever if anyone you else has, uh, I'm putting uh, my feet up on my little stool. I'm great. a little blanket on. I'm doing that. Awesome. Blanket. Um, talking a little bit about global Getting remote, cozy. um, because you know, it's been, uh, an incredible last few years worldwide pandemic, showed that remote work is effective. Uh, you know, there's all sorts of wild studies coming out that are like, oh man, people are being asked to return to the office and productivity is plummeting. And, and then the quiet, there was all of this very interesting stuff that kind of changed, evolved, uh, maybe was explored during the pandemic in ways that it, that it wasn't. So, um, you know, I think people generally are really interested in this idea of global remote. Uh, there's some companies that have put their hands up and said, we, we commit to this. Um, for me, I think one of the biggest things that always intrigued me about global remote is that I'm just uh, a kid from the cornfields of Omaha, Nebraska. And you know, when I was growing up, I didn't see uh, the right exit and the right entrance for how I was going to get involved in, you know, the video game industry. Thankfully, the internet came around and I'm like, oh, I can totally see my path now because this, it, this makes it so it doesn't matter where I live. Well, then, of course, as tech advanced and, you know, Silicon Valley kind of became a central location of where you needed to be to get a job at these companies, right? Suddenly we had all of this turn, you know, if, and flip upside down. And I love this because I think the idea of some um, incredible game designer or artist who you know, lives in a, a place of the world 
that you would never expect they'd be able to get a job here. Well, it's not any more about their location. It's actually about their actual talent. And it means that suddenly there is a pool of talent that is remarkably larger than anything that we've ever seen. So um, this question came in, what challenges and success have you experienced at Fortis so far from scratch as a global remote structure? And then questioning like, are there any limitations around employee locations? I'd probably also ask like, um, you know, why was this important to Fortis and, and is the talent pool and, and that being so large is, was that a part of it? Sure. Uh, before the pandemic, I would never have thought about doing it. Like, uh, I had, I was very clearly in the standard Silicon Valley model. I raised around the funding. I hired a number of people. I brought them to Silicon Valley. We worked in a small room together and we tried to build a company. Right. Um, when we founded Fortis, it was very unclear what was going to happen with the pandemic. Right. And so you right. kind of have to make a judgment call, right? Like, are you going to start remote and then eventually go in person or are you just going to go full bore remote? And so what we decided is that we would go full bore remote. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for that. And so the entire company strategy reflected that. So for example, like we made some acquisitions early on. Uh, and those acquisitions were in Brazil, Romania, and Portugal, right? And the reason why we acquired in those locations is we thought there was strategic value to having people in those locations, having a network in those places, having senior personnel in those places, uh, you know, because if you were going to be global and remote, then you wanted to try to get access to a bunch of talent pools that would want to work in the design lane that didn't currently have the opportunity to, to do that because right. of their location. Right. And so I think the quality of people that join the company is really, really high. And the density of talent in the uh, company is also uh, very high, but it came with trade-offs. And I just wrote like a, my most recent blog was like a bit about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and the trade-offs are like substantial, right? Like you, you exist in an environment that is creative and <laughs> creative environments are really brutal on the psyche, right? Like, yeah. they, like you, you need to be arrogant enough to think that you can create something great, but humble enough to take the feedback that what you're doing may, may not be in the direction of great and how you balance that in a remote environment is way, way harder. Because normally what happens is everyone kind of gets in the room and they just yell about design for two hours, maybe four hours, sometimes 10, right? Like, and you're just arguing, you're arguing, 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 people are up at wild boards and scrapping over things. And someone else coming up and drawing the alternate system. And <laughs> at the end, you kind of like maybe get to a solution, maybe don't. Some people are raw. Some people are, are satisfied that their way won, whatever. But then everyone goes out to dinner. You know, they get pizza and they hang out right. and they just relax. And everyone just remembers that that was an intense debate, but ultimately they like each other and they chose to work in the company because they like the people. Yeah. You lose that in a remote environment. Um, like the relationships become more transactional. The feedback is way harder to hear because, uh, you know, you get off the call and then you're sitting there by yourself. Right. And you're just like, well, like they hated my idea. They hated what I'm doing. You know, they hate me. I hate me. Right. And the support system is weak. Right. Relative to what you have when you're in person. Um, and so recognizing that you kind of have to say you're remote from the beginning and then you're going to have to hire people that can handle that environment that will feel like it has less support, even if it doesn't, it'll still feel that way. And feelings are, are, are really what governs how people sure. you know, uh, view yep. a job as yep. opposed to like the actual reality of what's occurring, right? Yeah. It's like, how do I feel about what's happening, right? 100%. Uh, and so I think remote environments tend to feel more disconnected and, and isolated. And you need people that are like, like kind of like oriented towards dealing with that, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that that's, that's, that's been the big challenge on our side. 
is like, how do you find those people? That's why we use the interview process that we do, which is like a little bit annoying and arduous for most it's people. It's not annoying and, really, and it is amazing. It, I, I, I can't- It's great for the people that are gonna work in our system. That's why it's designed that way. And it's annoying for the people that don't, right? Like we talk about it, right? Like we use prompts. A lot of people are just like, well, why are these people just sending me stuff and giving me work to do? The short answer is this company, you're gonna be evaluated by your ability to write and communicate thoughtful um, you know, ideas and take feedback you know, through a bunch of comments. Like, and that's how it's gonna feel inside the company. If you don't wanna do that, you're gonna hate the company. And you know, by the way, in the design lane, like the person who's loudest and most aggressive is not going to win very often. And in fact, they shut down debates so much that we can't have them that often, right? Like I'm the person that's the most problem inside of the company around this stuff because I have strong opinions, I push them aggressively and turns out like, that's not very supportive to the creative process at times. <laughs> and so like, you really have to find ways to like allow a different type of yeah. person yeah. to be a leader in the company. And it's like, like our interview process supports that as well. Right. Yeah. Um, but it's not for everyone. In fact, it's not for most people. I, I mean, you know, having gone through the process and even got our, our you know, my first job posted and stuff, I, it's one of those things where Sean, I look at it and I'm just like, this is a big, this is a big duh to me as in why doesn't everyone do this? Because there is something, I mean, yes, sitting down with a person while this person communicates clearly with me, they can, uh, communicate their third thoughts. Well, they, it, that that's great. You can get a feeling about, about someone, um, but how do you truly determine if someone is going to be right for the environment that you described and get done the work that you want to do, right? I, I talk so much as a leader and that one of the things that's so important to me is trust and confidence, right? And I want to be able to trust the employee to go and say, this is what needs to get done. I, I know that putting it in your hands means that, that that's going to happen. And I think for me, the prompts and getting to see how someone thinks through something, how they're going to approach something. It's just, I don't really ever want to do another interview that would be any different than that. Because I think first for, you know, as if I'm hiring, I look at that as a, a great way for me to kind of figure out. And just for clarification, so people know the prompts are as simple as here's three questions that we'd like to hear your your thoughts on. And the idea is to understand how someone might tackle a problem or how they might perceive something. As you can imagine, a lot of mine were around community and the systems that support the community and what organization might look like, et cetera. And I, I've never had more fun working on a document, to be honest, because someone asked for my very explicit opinions and thoughts and philosophies and shit. Half the time I was like fighting for people to ask me those types of questions. So, um, I just think it's amazing. So I, yeah. I can lay out quickly why other people don't do it. The first thing is if you're not global and remote, you're, you're recruiting from a small local talent pool and the competition for that small local talent pool is quite high. Right. And so, you know, if a person is looking at a job offer from Facebook, Netflix, and you're a startup trying to convince them to join, then usually what you have to do is spend all of your time pitching them on why they should join and hoping you're making a good choice. And it's like putting any barrier in the way of them joining is a bad idea. Right. Um, right. Like Fortis, like, you know, I, I hopefully, you know, do you guys like what you guys see here is kind of what you get at Fortis, which is like a very direct, statement of how things work and how you know, things work but it's not really like a, a hardcore pitch for like why you should join it's very much like if you like this sort of thing it's great if you don't like this thing it's not great we can do that because we're global and remote and we can't have as much cultural drift right as other companies so like people need to opt out if they don't want to work in that system right and yeah. So, because like the the unifying aspects like yeah you've walked into twitch's office a bunch of time mark it's kind of cool Right, he's got like purple everywhere, and there's like you know, like throw pillows on couches and like LED lights and shit. Like, Is that you know, the it's bar? Like, cool. like, like they've right. got throw pillows yeah. on their couches? You wouldn't believe it. I mean, listen, my last startup was was sharing an office with a bail bondsman, so yeah, it was pretty cool by <laughs> comparison, right? Like, you know, the the 
the incredible um, like uh, power that location has to produce conformity. Like people are just used to like when they walk into a place that they don't know and they're uncomfortable and it's their first day, they just immediately start to adapt to whatever is around. Right. So it brings people closer to the cultural expectations. You have none of that in a, in a remote environment. Like in a remote environment, a person literally went from signing into one Zoom call into another Zoom call. And that was the change in companies, right? <laughs> like that was it, right? Like, and um, that 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 shift meant that you had to be a lot more specific about who joined yeah. now since we're global and remote though our pipeline of talent is much broader right like we get i don't know like two thousand applications a week right now right and it's just because we're global and remote and people want remote work and it's like hard to get jobs like this and it's like so we can be a little bit more like picky difficult specific uh whatever word you want to use around how people come into the company because we need them to start much closer to our, our cultural model than what we would do if we were live. Right. Yeah. I, I mean, that makes an enormous amount of sense to me. Of course, I'm someone who throughout my entire career has, has worked remote in some capacity. Um, you know, I think in the IT world, remote was just something that you, you had to do like no one wanted to be at the office at 2 a.m. to push, you know, updates to right, right, right. cloud backup servers and shit like that. So um, I but uh, I do think that it it does take practice, right, to be good at working remotely, kind of fitting into the ambiguous mold that you kind of talked about, uh, learn how to try to catch cues, not be afraid to kind yeah. of ask someone is like, hey. That I didn't upset you during that last meeting, because I I do that all the time. Um, but I it, it's 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 a fascinating uh, and really interesting thing uh, to to kind of discuss and talk I, about and be a part of. I think for the right person, like on the on the work on, on the, the the general like frontline individual contributor side, I think remote is probably just like a straight net win. On the manager side, it's like I think really really tricky. Right. Like I, I, the way I look at it is like I'm more productive in terms of the number of hours that I work because I don't have a commute, stuff like that. But I'm less effective because of the uh, like how much harder it is to be persuasive on the sort of like soft skills that management tend to be about in yeah. a remote environment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. So we've got about 20 minutes left, which I kind of figured would happen. Right. We wouldn't even get anywhere close to what I thought. So uh, someone on Twitter yesterday was like, hey. I've read Sean's blogs. I have uh, been to the homepage and bluntly they're like, I still have no fucking idea what you guys are doing. Right. And so I'm like, I can appreciate that. Like they, they have not, uh, there hasn't been any sort of official announcement right on the front page. Someone comes They're They're greeted with uh, not only an animation that I think is I really cool. I feel like, like the it, animation but, explains everything. And I'm a little confused on why we're getting the question. But. Uh, well, you know, as someone who likes to <laughs> create like layers of uh, naming convention, when I'm coming up with shows and stuff, <laughs> unfortunately, you've got to assume that if you don't clearly spell it out, then there's that. But anyway, it does have the words that accompany it here, Sean, which is we believe in creating games where you belong, the challenge minds, build connections, inspire communities. So uh, because I know that you're not going to sit here and say we are working on 50 games right now and here's exactly what they are. Can you at least use what we're seeing here on the screen to explain either a what Fortis may be making or the types of games or b what we would not make right like so for example Sean will Fortis build a game like God of War Ragnarok which is going to release next week uh no we will not okay we're not doing triple a immersion games um so I can talk about uh, the general parameters of like things that we care about. And I won't get into game concepts themselves, not just because like the standard reasons, but also like it's just kind of like a shitty thing to do to game So your, much for transparency. Thanks a lot. All right, great. Like, no, yeah. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but no, it, it, like, it comes down to like when it comes time to announce the, 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 the games, like the game directors and the people that drive that game should, should decide, you know, 
how how best to do that right like i'm not gonna i'm not gonna take their of course there, right like of course I, i'm supporting them creating stuff i'm not the creator um so in terms of things that we'll do things that are on model our games will always be mobile uh available and they will always be free to play and the reason why is that we want everyone to be able to play the game like that's like a starting thing for us half of our stuff generally will be cross-platform which means that we'll try to get it on pc and console um in some cases we'll launch pc first before it goes over the mobile phone or simultaneous launch it really sort of depends on like what we think the strongest go-to-market strategy is um we use a variety of business models and approaches as a general matter like i said we're kind of pragmatic about this stuff like we're looking for ways to build the largest and sort of deepest communities. Um, okay, well, what does that mean practically from a design level, right? Uh, what it really starts to focus on is uh, we look a lot at um, like more collective action issues, like how do you get a group of people to do things together? Um, we look a lot at uh, like decisions with impact. So uh, a lot of a lot of games have like standard linear progression models right. and we're a little bit less interested in standard linear progression. Like we're interested in like more branching progression and individual choices having an impact on like game state that allows for people that have made different individual choices to have something to talk about. Right. right. Like a, a, a good example is like, you know, in like a deck building game, like magic, the gathering, right? Like someone's playing white, someone else is playing black. It's like an interesting conversation. Why did you do this versus that? Um, in most service-based games, that range of possibilities really gets collapsed down, and there are not that many interesting choices to be made. There are not that many different like game states or outcomes to have, uh, and we tend to look at opportunities to have like a much wider array of options and people coming together around those options to discuss them. Right. Because we think it's more likely to generate a hobby. Um, you know, something that someone can be personally and emotionally invested into over a longer period of time. Not to say that AAA immersion games aren't awesome. They, you know, I spent some time when, uh, you know, at, 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 you know, kind of the last company I was at working in that space and seeing that space. And I'm really fascinated and, and, and impressed by the craft and how difficult it is to do oh, yeah. what they do. Um, it's just not, it's, it's not, it's not, it's not me. It's not what I'm, I, you know, like I love making stories and worlds. It's great. I do it a lot in my free time, but like the thing I'm really focused on is like, how do you get the world in a game, you know, and how do you get, how do you get people of very different backgrounds to find ways to communicate and participate in collective goals. Like games are one of the great unifiers that humanity has. Yeah. Probably one of the very, very few unifiers that humanity has. One of the few things where anyone can kind of come into a space and start coordinating, you know, like, doesn't matter what background you have. That's the big bad. Uh, you know, that's the big bad. We're gonna go fight the big bad together, and we're gonna do it in a way that feels really, really, um, you know, like interesting, uh, supportive. Like I, I, I want that. That's what I want. Right. Right. Um, yeah. So it'll be a range of games and a range of different genres, a range of different models, um, and you know, I think some people in the community will love them. Some of them won't. I guess is if you look at the entire portfolio, almost everyone would be interested in at least one of the games. It just kind of depends on what area and what type of like things they're motivated by. Right. Right. And obviously um, that answer is good because I think anyone who knows me or the work that I do or how I think about community, probably hearing that from you makes a lot of sense why I'm so interested and invested in kind of what, not only Fortis wants to do, but how it is embracing the idea of what you've just talked about, right? I, I, I mean, you and I even had this conversation before I joined the company, the idea of like, what is using Twitch as a litmus test? Like the fact that God of War, which people have been waiting for forever, like it's going to be popular on Twitch for about a week and a half. And the amount of time and money and effort that went into that. And now, don't get me wrong, like, I still have fond memories of playing the first game. And I'm going to love every second of this. And I'll probably watch my favorite creator oh, yeah. and play it, etc. I'm cetera. a day one buyer. Right? It's yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. But <laughs> you can't necessarily build a community. There's no ongoing thing. It is a, a start and stop. And we talked about Ultima Online early on. And we talked about other games that right create 
ongoing experiences give you as the player the power to create whatever experience you want to. Um, that is that that that's the kind of thing that it really interests me, and um, you know I think is is clearly been a big driving force in a lot of what we've talked about today over the last ten years. So um, that's that's I, what I'm excited about. If, if I'm gonna get like um, like on the more like personal side for a moment, right? Like, um, I, like, I really think it's tough to find, uh, like where you belong sometimes. Like, I think some people, yeah, uh, maybe it's really natural and it's easy. And, um, but for a lot of people and certainly the people that I, I tend to like to work with, uh, that I tend to like to interact with, you know, they've, they have ha found it more difficult. Now things have changed a little bit from when you know, you know we, you and I grew up right in the eighties and nineties when this stuff was extremely niche and very much not cool, right? Like I think gaming has moved much more towards the center, but that's come right. with its own issues. It's moved yeah. towards the center, the group of people that felt ostracized now feel like a lot of people are in their space, and that's created all sorts of pretty negative, you know, like reactions, which have been pretty unfortunate too. Uh, but like, it just keeps on coming back to like, I firmly believe that humanity is Earth's greatest invention and we just really suck at being humans, right? <laughs> like, like the way that yeah, we, we treat do. each other, the True. way that we do things is just, just rough. Like yeah. it's rough to watch, right? Um, and games is one of the very few places where I feel people just 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 become people they they, they put you know, they, they they move things a bit to the background right like identity and that type of stuff is a little bit less important because you know what you're like you're you're an elf cleric right like you're not you're not a, a person from this background from this thing here and i think that what's been really rough is like when proper incentives for good behavior aren't there a lot of that identity from the real world starts to leach in starts to create some really really rough environments inside of the games as well which were supposed to be like a sanctuary for people that felt a bit on the outside like to find community to find acceptance and right. that's been really really tough for me to see over the last like 10 years right um so i don't i don't think you know, I don't think Fortis is the solution for world peace. I don't, I don't think so, but I do know what I'm personally motivated well, shit, by. I got to scratch like, that off of the, the plan. No, I'm just I mean, <laughs> if it became the solution for world peace, like, you know, like, but like this idea that you could find ways to have people collectively act in pursuit of like group goals in ways that create interesting feedback loops that build ties and bond, you know, like, like that to me is, yeah. is I think like kind of like what sits at the core of what motivates me. Um, and I think that there is a way to take that motivation and map it to a commercial outcome that is sizable and large enough that allows us to keep making games and investing into communities. And that's really what the shift in model that we were talking about around accessibility provided. Yeah. Right. And yeah. AAA immersion is like an amazing play way to take um, like a vacation right from whatever is going on in your life to just be in a different place and to experience that. And I think it's like a really powerful, cool thing. Um, but it's not the same thing as community, right? right. It's not the same thing as belonging. And that's really what I'm more interested in. Yeah. Um, we actually have like five more questions, but, um, you know, I know you could probably slack off all day, but I've got a meeting in 10 minutes. So, um, I, I, there's, <laughs> there's a couple that, uh, there's a couple that I really would love to tackle, but I think it's very clear. I'd love to either do this again or hand you these, uh, questions and say, Hey, here's some blog material, Sean. Uh, or, so, uh, either way, there's a great question about community development, which of course I can, uh, talk all day about, about FOMO as player incentives, um, there is one question here, though, that I think is pretty important. This came from Seahole, and it says, So I hear Wheat will not be streaming next Friday. Do you know anything about that, or do you know how we can get him to stream next Friday? And they they believe this to be your fault that I can't stream next week. So, Yeah, I mean, like, listen, what you need to understand about Marcus is that he's a free spirit that goes where the world takes him. And 
Uh, my guess is that it's probably going to take him to Chicago for, <laughs> for a week next week. Um, and like, you know, just because I think that's probably where like the vortex of energy that gra- you know, draws him in is going to take him. Uh, I may happen to be there and, uh, you know, but that's, that's, that's purely coincidental. Um, totally I apologize. Yeah. I'll, 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 I'll apologize for, uh, for Marcus's absence next week. Um, you know, all I can really tell you that is that he's disappointed the community and he's disappointed me as well. <laughs> but, uh, I, I hope not. Something. I hope not. Um, no, man. Like, thanks for, thanks for having me on the show, Marcus. It was a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah like, I, I, I've watched it. It's cool to be on it. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, thanks. When, when Sean actually reached out to me for the first time, um, via Twitter DM, which is pretty, pretty brave of him, but I, happened to answer right into all, all of my DMs. Yeah. Uh, but you know, I remember, I think one of the first things Sean said was like, you know, when you left Twitch, I had, I started watching a few of your streams and I'm like, Oh God, like, I don't know, <laughs> but it was amazing because Sean's like the way that you talk about community, that's what I want to talk to you more about. And I'm like, Oh my gosh. Cause I've kind of been like, I've kind of been, a flamethrower, uh, you know, but, um, I always, I always like super appreciated that. And, uh, it was, uh, it was fun, a fun little process. We needed, we needed a really strong voice. I think you can hear the passion uh, that I have for it, but like, ultimately I don't have the time to do it well. And we needed to delegate the responsibility of driving that to someone and it's not it's not easy to find someone that I think like not just has the history, but like you're a content creator too. Like it's just all of it, right? It's like a package of like this is what it's like to be immersed in community for 20 years, and this is where I think it's at and where it should go. And that was sort of what I was looking for, right? Like both product and community kind of rolls into me, and it's you know two very senior people, Calvin, our chief product officer, and you, that I'm looking at at, at, at sort of sitting as a core pairing around like how are we going to find our audience right um mm-hmm. and, and and why are they going to feel great once they've arrived um so Which I, your strong I, opinions were helpful in that i hey <laughs> um you know and and i've even i've even got uh, the uh because i like to write i i like to especially like to write a nice little document but uh when sean said to me you know, I want you to use your writing voice a little less and use your streaming voice a little more. I was like, I know that I made the right decision here, that that is feedback that I got from, (laughs) from my boss. And I really did appreciate that. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I actually, I thank you because I think sometimes, and I fear this for other content creators in the space. Um, sometimes you get labeled as, the YouTuber, the Twitch streamer, the esports guy. Um, but uh, I very rarely is someone like, oh, you know, the the work guy, the guy that, that can do. And I love that aspect of what I do, whether it's IT or esports or live streaming. Um, so to be able to bring all of that is is it's it's good. And, and thank you, because there's a lot of people that just be like, oh, knows how to make content. It, hire him. That's all he's going to do. It's like, yeah, that's actually not what I want to do at all. So except for this, except for this. No, man, I, I, I've been, I've been really, it's been really fun working together. Right. Like it's really, it's been fun. Like having a chance to meet all the game teams and everything. Right. Mm -hmm. You guys have no idea how hard it was to convince, convince Marcus to join. Like he just thought I was completely full of shit. Right. Like I had to like introduce him to like 20 other people and they all had to convince him in order to get him to like come over and work with us. Right. Um, It's, it's, I'm glad it worked out. I'm glad it worked out too. So I would like for us to do this again sometime. If you're down, uh, I'd love to g- just dive deep on the community side. We only dabbled in it today, but, um, so let's, let's maybe in a, in a few weeks or something, we'll arrange something else. Yeah. Yeah. Listen, if you guys want to hear more, or you guys just want to talk about the industry and why it works the way it does, then, you know, I'm always happy to come and hang out. Awesome. All right, man. Thanks cool. so much, Sean. Appreciate Thanks, it. Pete. You have a good one. We'll talk Later, soon. Bye-bye. Bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye chat. Have a good one. Chat, you are very well behaved today. Sean had no, he didn't skip a beat, huh? With uh, with you all in chat. Uh, I'll tell you what. Welcome to Epileptic Gaming. Yo, Xenos.
what up? Um, I've got to wrap it up here. Uh, I've got a meeting in like three minutes, but I want to thank Sean for coming on. Uh, I, I like transparency or not. Hopefully you can kind of see why I personally, because many of you know my background, what I stand for, what I believe in, but why personally Fortis is such an attractive place to work, right? It really does fit a lot of my criteria for a, not only what I've experienced and what I don't want to experience again in, in the future, you know, like I, it, it feels good to be listened to. It feels good when your opinion is, is valued. It feels good when the things that you fundamentally and passionately believe in are things that other people fundamentally and passionately believe in, but you're still getting a wide range of uh, opinions, perspectives, both culturally and industry wide. Um, you know, the amount that I've learned about game development already in the short time that I've been there uh, is is amazing. And it, it is uh, increasing my respect that I have for those that embark on this journey and, and why things are tough. And uh, but still is a part of my job to right fight and represent on behalf of the player. I think what's so incredible is that in everyone that I work with, they understand that the hardest part of my job is wearing two hats, a hat that represents the Fortis, you know, this is what is good for the company, but a hat that represents like, this is what is important to the community, the voice of the players, the voice of creators, et cetera. And there is such a fragile and, and, and interesting balance that has to be kept there. Um, but when a company is dedicated to figuring out what that balance is, it feels pretty damn good.